And so I know that some of you who have dedicated education projects going on, I've asked to give a little bit of an input just to start sharing and, and I guess we can start doing that now. So um, there's of course no specific order in case anybody really wants to go first or go next, you can also let me know via the chat. But I thought we could take about five minutes each to talk about our work and then pass on the mic and then in the end just have a general sharing session. So maybe Rosanna, would you like to start? Um, so hi, I'm Rosanna. Um, I know uh, most of you, but not everyone. Um, I'm based in the Philippines and um, I've been running kind of like an R&D space for education for the past eight years. It's called Sparkle Lab. And um, we really started trafficking in the non-formal education sector first. So coming up with after school programs and summer camps in our kind of like creative play space slash maker space. Um, and the kids and the parents really loved it. And they were asking, you know, like saying like, why can't school kind of look like this, you know, um, um, in general, right? And um, so after talking to kids and parents and running a lot of focus groups with them, um, I, uh, we have shifted and we are actually continuing our, our other programs, but also starting an actual school. So um, we were supposed to open this year. Uh, in August with preschool and kindergarten and then build one grade level at a time till we go from K through 12, which is the education system here. K being kindergarten, 12 being um, the end of high school when you then apply for university. Unfortunately, the pandemic really caught us off guard. So, um, so in March, we had finished, you know, I mean, like end of February, finished building the school from scratch, um, you know, furnishing it, started hiring teachers. We had a product team um, in place. So those are the designers, artists, makers, and technologists who support teachers in the teaching. And we, we had no idea this was going to happen <laughs> at all. Um, so it's been a rough year um, after, um, so basically we, the Philippines went on enhanced community quarantine, um, a very strict lockdown from March 14th to June. And, um, and then it was announced that there would be no face-to-face -face classes for the entire school year and until a vaccine was found. And so this put us in a really difficult situation. Um, we had to cut everyone's salaries. Um, we only have three people currently working. We had to retrench a great part of the team. Um, and our landlords wouldn't give us reprieve and rent. And so to this day, we are actually still paying rent for a space that is not utilized. Um, luckily, I was able to sublease about 85% of the space to startups who are, in fact, doing well during this time. Startups um, of friends of mine, which have more to do with delivery um, and food and medical supplies. Um, but that said, it's, it's still been really hard. Um, and, um, but, so the plus side is we've been able to reach quite a bit of families and offer online programs. But the online programs we offer um, aren't for, uh, aren't daily classes in preschool and kindergarten because it's it's really difficult for parents. The profile of our parents is that we have, you know, working moms and both parents are just so overworked and um, homeschooling on top of that is really difficult. So, right? <laughs> and so, um, so we offer kind of like twice a week programs, three times a week programs. Um, they don't generate as much income, obviously, as tuition. Um, so that's been the difficult, uh, the difficult part is kind of like keeping us afloat. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to open come August. We've been keeping a lot of, um, paying a lot of attention to the vaccine trials, um, thinking of the protocols we'll be putting in place. Um, and also having conversations about with parents about having smaller pods, group of kids of four kids and one teacher meet, et cetera. So, um, so that's where we're at right now, kind of. Yeah. Thank you. Incredibly challenging situation, of course, and 
at the same time, such an incredible success story that you were able to be a, build a formal school out of what started as a makerspace. Um, thank you for sharing, Rosanna, and maybe we can see how to yeah, sort of I'm sure there's quite a few similarities between other initiatives sort of finding themselves in a similarly difficult situation, perhaps how to exchange some solidarity. Um, Mel, do you want to go next? Since you were just switched on your camera. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, yeah, similar situation with uh, kids at home, a lot to do. Um, yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not really sure where to start best. I think we, we put the focus on Oh, you just froze. So let's go somewhere else and then maybe you can figure out the connectivity situation in the gig office. <laughs> um, so Summer, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um... Okay. Well, oh, I'm okay. right. oh, should I stop some? Is it working? Oh. Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, okay, okay. cool. So well, basically uh, what I've been doing uh, in the last, last three, three months, let's say. Yeah, it's now three months. Uh, I've moved back to Palestine uh, since I was in, in Germany and I finished my degree over there in human computer interaction. And now I'm I'm like uh, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm teaching at a, at a university here in Palestine. It's called Al Quds uh, University. Uh, basically, what we are building, we're building this uh, a new track uh, between that. Uh, it is like an interaction between. Uh, design journalism and actually interaction design. Uh, so what we are teaching here, uh, what we what we build it, it's it's like uh, a life 3.0 approach. Uh, that's we uh, we are focusing that people get more skills, uh, regardless for for being a journalist or not. But basically, uh, trying to build like uh, this kind of. Uh, collaboration between different kind of uh, tasks that people can join together. So basically what we did is, uh, is like this curriculum that has the base for the whole journalism tracks. Uh, so we have three tracks, like for, for the first one, it's audiovisual uh, media. The second one is uh, interaction design. And the third one is, uh, wait, what was it? Anyway, I forgot what is it, but it's, uh, it's something related to journalism. Uh, uh, at the end, like the whole, the whole students will have like these three different tracks, but at the end they will have like one joint uh, uh, project. So they have like this uh, kind of capstone project. They will all work together. So I am actually the supervisor on, on the interaction design uh, track. Um, so my responsibility here is like to, to focus uh, on what really students really need to learn over there. So since I came back, and actually before I came back to, to Palestine, I knew that, that there was, there is like a serious problem bet between like newspapers here and, and how they can get the information. And we have at the same time, like journalists who are freelancers, they go into the field, into the, core of the problem and they post and usually these uh, these these posts that they they publish like either on social media or or whatever which platform they do uh, post on it it get deleted it's either because of the israeli surveillance or or because like nobody listens to them at some point but to to close this gap i i i try to to combine between these freelancers who goes into the field and uh, also to to uh, to to connect them with the, with the, with the newspapers for example like one of the newspapers contact me once and they said okay yeah we have a problem we need we need to raise more subscribers i was like yeah okay but you're not getting any 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 new any news from people you're just copying from 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 the internet, and you are or copy it from from another newspapers, and that doesn't make anybody interested to subscribe. So, so 
I, I took this story and I reflected actually it to, the, to the curriculum itself. So here in the interaction design that I built, like uh, we're teaching the, the, the students um, the, uh, the digital storytelling, what they should do and exactly uh, how they should do it also. Uh, it's either in visual or in, in writing. Uh, also the interaction design itself I'm um, sorry, not the interaction, uh, design thinking and the real steps of design thinking. Because at some points like here, I saw how people practice design thinking and not really following the real steps of it. Uh, so, so basically they just uh, think a little for five minutes and then start with the prototype and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, so so that's, that's exactly what I'm focusing on to, to give them um, um, more, more uh, practice and uh, more uh, hands-on stuff to 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 get into into the into the real education and real to know exactly what they are doing. Um, later on, I'm, I'm now for, for now I will I will start like try to to build a maker space also within this uh, uh, department uh, because. Um, this is really important for the, the people here to, to start to put their hands on, on, on real stuff. Uh, why would it that help in journalism? There's a lot of things. Uh, we can, uh, like in Palestine, it's not a simple uh, uh, area that the journalists are always addressed. So uh, like, uh, and they are always like in, in the field, which is dangerous. So maybe they can build their own tools, their own stuff there. Um, I don't know, they're on electronics at least. I don't know what, what kind of things could come for, for the makerspace, but basically it is uh, one of the approaches that uh, I'm going to it soon, but until um, now uh, things are going slow due to the pandemic and hopefully things will go well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samer. Um, I think I'm imagining um, that curriculum development could be one sort of cross-cutting issue <clears throat> where it would be interesting to have some more exchange within the network. So thank you very much for that. And now Mel's changed her headphones and I'm passing it over to her. <laughs> I've changed it all. The connection, <laughs> the headphones, I hope it's running now. We can hear okay, you clearly now. <laughs> I already spoiled into the uh, general chat in German what I'm going to say. Um, so uh, maybe uh, shortly about me, I'm in, in uh, technical teacher training. So I teach uh, electronics and technology and digitization in teacher education at the Technical University in Berlin. Um, this is one part uh, of my job. Apart from that, I'm also working with Geraldine in uh, Connectiv. But as we're talking about education today, um, maybe my the thirdest me, uh, which is taking a lot of time at the moment, is um, an, a new nonprofit um, that I started founding, which is called Cyber for Edu or Cyber for Edu. Um, so we naively met a year ago at the Chaos Communication Congress. Um, all of us, most of us have kids. And so the topic was, well, data security is really important and there's more and more software coming to the schools. Um, and we want to help the schools and parents and students to be aware of that and to be uh, um, to not, not to use software that steals your data and yeah to, to be more more sensitive about data security and so and, and commercial um, digital software at, at schools. So that was in December and then we started this new little NGO. Um, called Cyber for Edu, and we thought hmm, maybe we have some schools to learn more about free software, maybe not to use Google and Microsoft. And then the pandemic came, and then suddenly everyone needed uh, GDPR conform. How do you say conform? GDPR uh, uh, compliance. Com compliance software. Um, and suddenly there was a big uh, problem in, in Germany because the schools couldn't use Zoom, they couldn't use uh, Teams, they couldn't use any other services um, that were not GDPR compliant, especially when working with underaged kids. Um, 
so uh, we were first at the beginning we were in the position don't use this don't use this don't use this and suddenly all the schools said but well then what should we use we cannot only complain we need you to help us out of here so um, we started as a um, as an ngo to offer software and we started to run our own servers and we started to offer um big blue button as an open source uh free and GDPR compliant software. Um, and then at the moment, we're in the process of, of building up more capacity for other services, also like Nextcloud and Matrix Chat um, and Moodle as a learning platform. Um, and it turned out that this was something um, we were just at the right time to offer and that yeah, so that was mostly what uh, we've been done with Cyber for Edu, and which took a lot of time and uh, a lot of uh, energy, but it was really also worth it. We got a lot of schools that contacted us and that we could um, help out. And um, yeah, we've we have got a lot of uh, great feedback, and now we're working with uh, with the state government in Berlin. Um, and yeah, so this was a, a very busy time. Um, but at the same time, also a very nice and positive experience that open source uh, software, um, yeah, that schools are really interested in, in, in testing different uh, non-commercial services. And um, yeah, that also the software works really well. So Big Blue Button is now really used quite um, a lot at German educational institutions. Okay. I. I think that was maybe the pandemic, for the pandemic context, the most uh, uh, suitable piece of my education uh, involvement uh, I could talk about at the moment. As I said, I'm in teacher education also, and there we're doing a lot of maker education. So a lot of with uh, maker and fab lab uh, and, and tinkering and building stuff with my, with my students who are future teachers for technology education. Um, and they really love it. So I'm trying to influence more teachers to do this kind of stuff at schools with kids. Thank you, Mel. Um, thanks very much for sharing. And I mean, we can touch on the other topics in, in discussion as well. Now, um, yeah, I know Jasper wanted to share something as well, but I know there are a bunch of other people with interesting initiatives too. So um, I think Patanga and and Twa here, I'm letting Anna in, because it's Anna. <laughs> um, on here, I'm happy to share um, some of their work in another um, occasion, or now just in a sentence, which is that Twa here is basically trying to bring connectivity to school children in Kenya. And uh, Rodrigo has been engaged in a, in a school in Brazil where he runs a maker space that is part of the official curriculum. So a couple of steps ahead to what we're doing here in Germany. Um, I'll leave that as a short summary. And Jasper, would you like to share next? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, the situation here in India is also like same. Uh, so we have a continuous lockdown from uh, a big lockdown, I can say from like uh, March to June or July. And some areas will even have longer uh, lockdowns. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, school totally shut off and still uh, still the schools are not open. So uh, it's like uh, people are very much worried about the loss for one year of studies. Like, uh, uh, And the situation is same like everyone in the world. So teachers, uh, they are not uh, getting salaries on time. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, schools are not, uh, children are not going to the schools. And uh, uh, so... So we, we we try to make some to set up some solutions for them that uh, they can start uh, they can start something uh, uh, something which can enable them uh, a kind of uh, a connectivity uh, through uh, a small mobile server. So uh, we created one small mobile service servers that are portable one and uh, that can be easily powered up with the uh, with the power banks. And they have small, uh, uh, small uh, uh, storage inside them, and running on two GBs uh, RAMs. And uh, you can locally put all the contents, uh, just like uh, 
uh, some uh, class one to class sixth, and then from seven to tenth. So, uh, uh, and then uh, and then using our community networks, uh, we, uh, we can we can centralize this data at one at one place, and then connected that data to the uh, to these mobile servers can enable digital education using these mobile servers. So. Uh, uh, currently, the situation is like uh, uh, teachers, you know, they are recording videos and lectures and sending through WhatsApp. And again, some people don't even have mobile phones here in Kurv. If we, if, we, if we talk about rural areas, so uh, so uh, this initiative, uh, uh, like government, is very slow in that uh, they they are they, there is a long and lengthy process uh, for them to adopt some solution. Uh, so we have shown them. Uh, Shown, shown to many uh, state education officers uh, virtually uh, about this product and tell them that they, this can really help. So now, but again, there is very, very less response from them. So uh, so we are now directly uh, talking to the schools to, uh, to adopt this solution. And uh, one or two schools, we have uh, a, a demo kind of stuff in which uh, all the videos and lectures of one class, uh, class seventh, has been recorded and put in, put it in the mobile servers and then uh, taken into the rural areas, and then inviting uh, all the children. So these mobile servers will have a HDMI ports and that can be connected to the uh, big screen projectors, as well as to the tablets. So we have taken tablets along with us. So it's a like day activity. We have taken these uh, servers into a bag, gone to the rural area, and connected uh, uh, and connected uh, uh, this mobile server with the uh, with the digital projector and allow them to study. So we have seen great impact on that, and uh, and uh, there was one uh, feedback from the from the local teachers as well that uh, we wanted to continue. I mean, after you go, so we just wanted to have uh, sessions. So we keep these kind of servers over there only and uh, daily uploading the stuff, uh, local lectures over there. So with the help of local over people and they really uh, started uh, learning on that things. So that is really uh, uh, creating some change uh, about, uh, uh, about the digital education through using this uh, e-server. So I think, uh, I think uh, this solution can be replicated. And uh, again, there is nothing rocket science in it. It's just a small uh, Pi server, you can say. You can use a Pi server, Raspberry Pi server, or uh, some small Ubuntu uh, machine having uh, a locally stored XAMPP over there and put in all local data over there. You can even connect Wi-Fi with them because that mobile server will have LAN port itself. So uh, uh, combining this uh, will become a more uh, you know, scalable solution and and uh, and uh, uh, some meaningful uh, meaningful solution for the rural areas where there is no connectivity and they are far away from the areas. So uh, yeah, I think uh, this is what uh, we have done in this pandemic situation, uh, where education is really hit up with the uh, uh, with this uh, uh, lockdown situation and still the schools are not open. Yeah, I think. This is a small brief about what we have done in this situation uh, and trying to connect uh, uh, and provide uh, uh, education to the local communities and to the school children. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jaspreet. It's such an incredibly important angle between connectivity and, um, and education. Um, a little bit of a different approach to a similar problem that Saad has been <laughs> addressing by equipping school children with thousands of laptops in Singapore, which we forgot to talk about a little bit in our opening session yesterday. Um, I'm gonna ask into the round if there's anybody else who would like to share their work before we go into a bit of discussion mode. Alex? <laughs> yes, I can briefly introduce what we are doing. It's not pandemic specific. But, um, well, so I'm working in a really rural area in the deep south of Germany. So it's really like on the border. And um, there are a lot of mountains. We have a lot of valleys and they are all disconnected. So we have a huge infrastructural problem to deliver our educational programs to the kids. 
So um, we are now visiting schools with um, a mobile Fab Lab and uh, provide educational program. Um, yeah, well, in a mobile way, so the kids don't have to come to us, but we come to the kids. The education comes to the to the pupils, to the schools, and so on. And we want to lower the barrier, um, like the entrance barrier, to the like to the smallest barrier ever, so um, you can't stumble over it. And um, so far, we are um, actually quite successful with that. And uh, we um, reach a lot more people um, for now. And also, the school program um, can go on um, with the current restrictions. Um, we still are, like, we still can visit the schools. But, um, well, we all have to wear the mask. And the groups are a bit smaller, so the pace is a lot smaller, uh, slower. Um, but our program can go on and, um, well, I just want to briefly introduce what, what we are doing. So, um, yeah, and I'm actually quite happy to, to listen to all your stories and how, um, how your projects are going and what you are uh, bringing up and developing. So, um, yeah, I'm glad to take part in the discussion now. Great, thank you. If anybody, everybody has shared can drop their Twitter handles in the chat, that would be amazing because then people can shout out and share as well. Um, thank you. Is there anybody else in the room who'd like to share on their educational related activities? You can still jump in if you haven't jumped in yet, but I would like to then throw out um, yeah, um, I haven't prepared a moderated panel, but really thought we can just jump into a little bit of a, of a session to talk about how we'd like to connect some of these thoughts and efforts. Um, so um, now you've heard the others and sort of other topics they're working on. Is there anything anybody would like to um, pick up or, or yeah, um, or, or elaborate on? It's quite uh, the situation here with my, my son, it's just like you know, just pre described, you know. Uh, it's a public school and it gets some tasks through WhatsApp, far, far from enough, you know. And then, of course, here we have this like this routine of studying, and I keep talking about it with me and with many other parents. Uh, but most of population, especially in rural areas, just like just be said, you know, it's the same thing. And uh, it's quite interesting the discussion, for example, of these tools, just like Mel said, uh, how it how it can can be used, for example, in this landscape. In, in, in these scenarios, more local scenarios, because for uh, I have other examples of children using these Zoom things, and it's quite boring for them, you know, and it's quite terrible for them. Even for us, we try to do this stretch morning. We know each other for long. We are adults. <clears throat> so uh, it's 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 a uh, Hot situation, you know, all around the world, and whoa, when you walk around SMS, uh, in the beginning I was thinking about this WhatsApp idea quite good, but because it's accessible, WhatsApp is free, not as in beer, oh, actually as in beer, free as in beer, so, you know, Everyone is drinking beer all around. Probably we will access all the children everywhere. But then the content production, how do you create content WhatsApp? And these bots like Mrs. Kasaknova that was with us, that is a mix of a half mind, half bot. Uh, you know, they know how to produce content. They produce quite good content and disseminate content to, to educate the population. And they are doing quite well. 
you know, uh, and we have also this huge problem of how to access uh, TikTok. Oh, you know, so I think I have, we have a huge gap, a huge gap. I have to check all the times the YouTube videos uh, Miss, Mr. My Son is watching, you know, because otherwise the YouTube algorithm that all of us know, uh, what are our algorithms, you know, or our legal tools. But Okay. I think that's like, I mean, he, I can just tap in with a tiny anecdote experience, maybe that um, it's been really interesting for me to observe during the lockdown how different the homeschooling was for my godchildren who are now living in the US and supplied with a tablet each and basically spending their school day in Google Classrooms or preschool Zoom chats, which are also completely you know, here's the video you watch, here you draw online, here you, so very, very, um, like taken the education they would have done in a normal physical classroom, put online, and, and how that's working for some kids and for others, not so much depending on your individual learning um, skills. But and here, you know, we just have a situation where basically all this is still considered tools of the devil and not should be not let into any classroom so a really different different situation Mel, Mel did you want to say something uh yes of course because <laughs> it is the devil <laughs> no um I think there's uh, a lot lots of uh, important levels on this discussion one thing is uh, you were talking about kids having tablets and hardware and um, the biggest problem we experience also here in Germany is not those kids that have the hardware and the internet connection that have their own room where they can sit and study, but the maybe 30% of children who share a tablet with their whole family, who have a slow internet connection, who don't have their own room, and who have to negotiate with their siblings and parents who can use which device when. And that's like the first prerequisite to then say, okay, now the teachers need to be um, willing to use um, a video conference software. Now the school needs to um, either pay for something or like this is all coming later. Like the first step here is really to make sure, um, like, do those that already are disadvantaged um, in, in the normal school routines not get even further uh, behind uh, during the pandemic? Um, and I think this is a very important issue, but of course I agree, um, we also have a problem with accepting that the digital world is part of education. We still have a, a big group of teachers that thinks there is this digital stuff that has nothing to do with me. And then there is my subject, which I have taught very well for 30 years and I'm not going to change that. Um, so this is also definitely a change of uh, mentality to say, look, the digitization should be part of every topic, whether it is in the way you teach or whether it is how you address certain topics or, um, yeah, so there, there's many levels. But yeah, the, the one big problem is really um, having access to software, um, hardware, uh, having a school that is willing to translate lectures into, I mean, in Germany, not even the teachers have laptops. That's not part of their work equipment. So they are all using private um, equipment, which also shouldn't be. And then if you're using your private software on your private hardware, which is maybe not even that safe, and you have possibly all your, all the student information stored in a Google Drive because that's all you have available. It is really um, a data security issue. It is not one that the schools should be um, confronted with so much. This is something really that the state governments should take care of and make sure that they have the infrastructure and the services and the safe environment to teach online and should be supported in using it. Um, 
but yeah, there's lots of different levels um, how this can be achieved. And, and one is this very basic, we need infrastructure and hardware for all pupils. Um, and I, I have a question on this point because I feel what often happens with this quick jumps into the digital world is that sometimes, so we change the format, but the content stays the same. So it's also a question whether the curricula itself needs to be changed because if we stay in a class with 20 people uh, and looking at a whiteboard, that's how, I, for example, I went to schools, it cannot be the same thing when you are looking in the screen. So I'm wondering if math is going to be taught in the same way, if science should be taught in the same way as we were doing in the school. And to me, this I feel this year is this lag because we all jumped so fast into the digital world, but we never thought about the content. How do we present this content through this new format? Um, yeah, it's a question. Rosanna, you raised your hand. I don't know if you also want to address this question. Oh, no, not this question. I just wanted to refer to what was being discussed earlier. Um, Do you want to add I that, can... though, and then we'll try to pick up both? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so regarding your question, Fadi, I think that's a good point. But I think also a lot of educators, you know, so teachers and school administrators were so busy in the transition from analog to digital that they didn't have time on top of that to vet the content and change it to fit the medium. At least that's what I saw here. Um, and I just, yeah, like listening to Mel and Jaspreet and Ricardo, like one of the things I think, like it's same situation here. So like, um, but I guess it's more, it's exacerbated because of two things. One is the, just like the, the massive amount of people we have here in terms of population, right? Um, and, and then the, the disparities between social economic classes as well. Um, one of the things that I found, so I did not enroll my son in preschool at all this year. Online learning didn't seem for me to be the way he understands things and the way he learns about the world, right? So I wouldn't want him sitting in front of a screen for a three-hour period or a four-hour period, which is what these preschools here are offering. I would rather him run outside, do free play. And then, you know, on occasion when I'm not so busy, which has been, you know, not that much either, <laughs> kind of like trying to do something with him. Um, so for the, for our school, we did not run full year workshops, but we wanted to give a hand to parents who were trying to homeschool their kids and give them some sort of normalcy. Right, so for the three to six year old age group, what we did um, starting two weeks after the shutdown was announced was provide kits. So we would have 12 session programs and deliver the kits to the parents. So they sign up for a class, it's twice a week or three times a week. You have everything in a box that you need to execute. No worries about going out. We couldn't physically go out. So like in preparing the kits, I had to order everything online because in the area where I live, you can only have one, the quarantine passes only in the name of one person. Um, and so it was in my husband's name, right? Because he, you know, could like run all the errands and do all the stuff. Um, so I physically couldn't even get out until mid-June when they were allowing more people from each household to leave the premises. Um, and procurement was also really difficult even finding things like finger paints for the kids to use that was like another problem but you know beyond the kids we were reaching because we're like a private school um i went into conversations with the department of education because i wanted to help them out um and reach kids in the public school area and it was this kind of thing where august september they didn't know what they were going to do they had to um kind of push back the August start to October and they were saying, well, you know, um, you know, maybe we'll use TV because they wanted to use internet and computers, but the vast majority of kids here don't have that. Um, so they were thinking maybe TV and radio, but they had not produced any content. Um, then they were thinking maybe Facebook, but that goes against the Data Privacy Act and keeping kids safe online. And I had so many conversations with them and I was trying to pitch like these different solutions. And now I just, I just kind of gave up because <laughs> it was too much of a, of a headache. Um, and I, and I think now what's happening is just kids are, are not 
really, I mean, they're not, so they're not being schooled, but I think they are learning and I think there's a difference. And maybe that this year is an opportunity to do that. I mean, like my son's like on an extended vacation. He's so happy. <laughs> like he wakes up late, he's up till midnight because I'm too busy doing other things to tell him to sleep. Like he's like just starting to play Super Smash Brothers right now. So, <laughs> so I mean, you know, you do what you can. <laughs> That's so crazy to hear, Organa. I mean, like, I don't want to go into this now, but just the fact that people even complain here about anything is insane listening to like the lockdown that you've been in. Um, but maybe just to sum up, I... And, and I don't work in this field like Mel does, but I, I sometimes get to dip into it. And I recently got to moderate a couple of sessions at this digital um, education conference. And the like gap between the ideas that are there, like the fact that people know the whole system with like subjects and what Fadio was saying earlier and, and the division that we have into the way, you know, this is the standard stuff you need to learn and then you're equipped for life. is just so antiquated and does not match any skill set that you actually need for life anymore. And there are all these ideas about how that should be changed fundamentally. And at the same time, nothing is moving, at least here. So it's just this huge sort of disparity between the concepts that exist and maybe like finding place in other uh, countries. Yeah, and oh, sorry. If I can jump in, one of the things also that I realized was, um, you know, for, I mean, like it also, I think it hits kids a lot more in urban poor areas, because if you're in like, you know, rural poor areas, you have everything that you need to learn, right? You run around, um, you can do physical play, you design games with your friends, you know, the act of creating rules and negotiating and settle conflict is a form of learning very much similar to a playground. You don't need a playground, right? You can collect shells in the beach, right, and count them. Um, you can, there's, there's so much to be learned. So I think also like in the, the, the urban areas, it's really tough. Um, especially because the, the lockdown there is so much more because these houses are like side by side and on top of each other and people aren't allowed to leave their homes, right? So, which is sad because they could just have so much fun learning and playing and building community on the street. Um, so I think also, yeah, um, there was too much of a focus on schooling and not putting kids at the heart of the learning experience when they try to design those solutions, right? Because you don't really need a lot of tech and here you can't do it anyway. It's too costly. Absolutely. Yeah, but I must um, say it was sorry. hard work. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So he was asked to see the kids, at least that we got online, build community despite the circumstances. So it made me realize too, and I think that's the last bit, is that kids are more resilient than we think they are. Mm -hmm. Let's have one or two more and then see how to wrap things up. But Samuel wanted to say something next. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I just have like this quick thought, actually. It's, it's just thinking about uh, like about the whole thing, how, how everything had happened like in the, uh, before the pandemic and during the pandemic and what could be happening after. So uh, before the pandemic, like everyone was looking for more digitizing, more equipment we all want all these computers all over all the world like every one of us wanted this and then at once we are into this and we're lost and we are what the fuck we are limited inside one fucking screen so what 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 should we do we should get out of that so uh, I'm, I'm talking like we should find a way like uh, at once we found it like the traditional way was much better or uh, like uh, not much better, but it doesn't limit us in one screen at least. Um, so my, my thought, well, I'm the same person who put artificial intelligence in the journalism curriculum, like it's the same thing, <laughs> same person who's talking. So uh, what, what I'm thinking, it's like, we, we have to find like this kind of uh, in between. We were not in between. We always wanted more digitization. And when we have it, we, we found it like, like yeah, we need to step back. Um, so I think, I think we, we need to find like this kind of medium that uh, maybe, maybe, maybe the maker movements, maker movement can, can create something in between. Like you can educate, but at the same time, to, to get educated, you have to go up outside or to, to move something or to, to study with somebody like near you or 
I don't know, something like that could be. I would like to go on also like to continue what you're saying, Samer, and to highlight also this thing that was mentioned several times today that learning is different than education, right? And I feel like if anything that is happening now in the world is that a lot of the the, the models or what we have, the structures that have been there are being disrupted in a way or another, right? Whether it's the classroom or the curricula or all of this. So as much as it's really like messy to get into this digital world, it could also be the chance where we think about what is education in the first place, where we think, did we really learn? Because I question my 16 years of going to school. I really do every day. Like I feel I, I would have used that hundreds or thousands of hours I might have you know used it differently um, and maybe just now that we are forced to stay at home and and forced to say hey what are we going to do about schools that we could use this opportunity to like really reshape everything we know about education and at least I talk from my experience in Egypt knowing that education is like really it's not a secret it's some of, uh, we're very, very uh, behind in, in all levels. Um, so yeah, just a thought. I think we're gonna have to use that as the sort of, um, yeah, summing up <laughs> to, to close the session.